Well, I'm afraid that whatever happens next, (laughs) it's going to be a little bit of a step back. (laughs) But join me in prayer nonetheless. Gracious God, we are so grateful for all of the ways that you reveal yourself to us. We're thankful for the ways you speak to us through the gift of music, through the gift of singing, through the gift of fellowship, through all of your spiritual gifts you impart to us. We are thankful for this opportunity to have our lives intersected in this way, in this time, in this place, in this house, around this word. And we pray as we gather now around this word directly that the words of my mouth and the thoughts and prayers of all of our hearts are pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Our scripture reading today comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, verses 41 through 52. And I will recite it and present it this way. You can read along in the Pew Bible if you wish, or you could simply sit back, watch, and listen. But here is Luke chapter 2, verses 41 through 52. Now, every year, Jesus' parents went in the spring to Jerusalem for the Passover. And when Jesus was 12, they went up as usual for the Passover. When the Passover was ended and they started to return, the boy, Jesus, stayed behind. But they did not know it. Assuming that he was in the group of travelers, they went one day's journey. But then They began to look for him among their relatives and friends. And when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search for him. After three days, they finally found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. But when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said, Child, why have you treated us like this? Look, your father and I have been searching for you with great anxiety. But Jesus said, Why were you searching for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he said to them. Then Jesus went down and came with them and went to Nazareth and was obedient to them. Mary treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and in divine and human favor. The word of God for the people of God. So we have here a family drama with lots of different components to which we might be able to relate in different ways or to different degrees. For instance, how many of your families or your families, either when you were children or your families now, went on a family vacation? Over Christmas or in the summer? Was it to the same place every year or different place year to year? But how many of our, your families loaded up the car, packed the station wagon or the minivan or the SUV and hit the road for some campground or destination? We know how those trips go, don't we? They start out, everybody's smiling, arm in arm, playing comfortably in the back seat. After a couple of days, air conditioner breaks down, that question starts coming from the back seat, from the little, what is it? Right? We've all been in the same car. But that's essentially what's happening here. The Bible is clear to tell us that every year, so it's a tradition, in the springtime, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph would gather with their relatives and friends and they'd pack their bags and in Galilee in the north and Nazareth and they would travel about 50 miles south to the big city of Jerusalem. 
spring break. It's a religious spring break, an annual pilgrimage that they made year after year in the springtime. And maybe that trip went a little bit like some of ours on the long trip down south. We know that Jesus on this trip is how old? 12 years old. And that age is important for this reason. At the time, a boy was considered to become a man at age 13. I'll just go ahead and let that sit for a minute. All 13-year-olds are men. But the significance of Jesus being 12 years old is what? He's not a man, but he's almost a man. He is on the cusp of adulthood. And though our age frame might be a little bit different, we think of adulthood now maybe, you know, starting it, that, that movement from childhood to adulthood, maybe 14, 15, 16, into the late teens, maybe the early 20s. But regardless of the age frame, what do we do in, in, that, in that period of adolescence when we stand on the, the cusp of adulthood? What are the things that we might do? Maybe rebel? Maybe push the limits? Maybe test boundaries, test the waters. We try new things. Part of becoming an adult is establishing our own identity over against the, the identity with which we were raised as children. There, there is, I believe, for every person that's ever lived, a time, an age we reach where we no longer want to sit at the kids' table, right, at Thanksgiving or family reunions. We want to sit with the adults or, or at least by ourselves and not with the little children. And maybe, maybe that's what's happening here. You see, Jesus gets separated from his parents in Jerusalem on this trip, and maybe it's not unintentional. You know, maybe Jesus, he's, he's in the big city here. He doesn't want to hang out with mom and dad, with the younger cousins who have to be holding hands to mom and dad. You know, maybe he wants to just kind of push away and explore and get out on his own. He's no longer just the carpenter's son. Now he's becoming the son of God and the son of man. Maybe that's what's going on. Irrespective, he's separated from his parents at a time when everybody's getting ready to go back home. And that was a key word that came in that story. Mary and Joseph, they assumed, right? They assumed that Jesus was in the group. And we know what that word means, right? We don't want to make assumptions. We make a you-know-what out of you-know-who and you-know-whom, right, when we assume but in their assuming that Jesus was with them, we then have the, the perfect home alone moments, right? We have the perfect home alone scenario. If you remember that movie, Christmas on, could be on everybody's Christmas list. Home alone, you know, the McAllister families getting ready to go to Paris, France for vacation, for the Christmas break. Mom and dad assume that nine-year-old Kevin is in coach in the plane with the family, only to discover mid-flight that he's home alone, right? And that's what's essentially happening here. Mary and Joseph assume that Jesus is with the group of travelers, so they leave, and they go a day's journey before they realize he's not there. He's in Jerusalem alone. <laughs> now, all kidding aside, it has to be the, the parents' worst Nightmare to think that they've been separated from their parents or from their child. A parent's worst nightmare is to be separated from their child even for a few moments. And when this happens in the story, Mary and Joseph do what? Do what any, any, any parent would do. Drop everything and run back to Jerusalem. Hustle back there as fast as they can. And they search high and low for him for three days. And when they finally find him, admittedly, it's not one of Mary's best moments. She'd probably like a do-over, right? Because she, she hits him with both barrels, accusations, finger-pointing. You see, there's a difference in, in communication theory, in counseling. When we talk about building healthy relationships, there's a difference between an I message and a you message, 
iMessages bring people together because they start with the feelings in me. You messages attack and drive a wedge between people. And see, what Mary wants to say to Jesus is, oh my gosh, I was so scared. I feel ashamed. I feel guilty that we didn't keep track of you. I, 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 right? This would have brought out the true feelings that she had in, the, in her heart. But what instead stumbled out of her mouth? You. How could you have done this? Why have you treated your father and me like this? You know, we, we may have seen that scenario at some time in our lives. A child today runs out into the street. And the mother and father runs after the child to protect the child, sweeps the child up in its arms, and then shakes the child and yells at the child. Right? Why do we do that? That's not what we intend, but it's sometimes what comes out. And Jesus, Jesus reacts with adolescent obliviousness. Huh? Has it really been three days already? I, I didn't even know you were gone. <laughs> and besides, why are you worried about me? Didn't, don't you understand that I should be in my father's house? Mar Mom, and you and dad just don't understand me. What's wrong with you? And the truth is they don't understand him. The Bible says clearly they did not understand what he was saying to them. And the question is, do we think Mary should have understood him? Do we think she should have? Uh, the angel Gabriel came to her 12 years earlier and said, you're going to give birth to the Son of God. Should she have remembered that 12 years later when she found him in the temple? I'm going to say no. I'm going to give Mary a pass on that. For this reason, first of all, remember how old is Jesus in this story? 12. He's not yet a man, which means he's still a child. In fact, there was a line in that story where it said, the boy Jesus was in Jerusalem, not the man Jesus. So he's still a boy, he's still a child, and children were not expected to be with the teachers of the law. Teachers of the law didn't have time for children. Children were not worth their time. There was no children's message in the synagogues at that time. You remember that story later in Jesus' ministry when people were bringing little children to Jesus? And what did the disciples do? How did they react? They tried to push the children away. Right? And Jesus said, no, what, that's why what Jesus did was so radical. Bring the children to me. But you see, it wasn't customary that children were with teachers of the law. So why should Mary think to look for Jesus in the temple? Because children were not supposed to be there. Teachers of the law were not supposed to be with them. And besides... When the angel Gabriel came to Mary 12 years earlier and said, you're going to give birth to the Son of God, he did not say how to raise the Son of God. And parenting is hard work. I'm sure that for every, every person who's ever been an adolescent, we have a lot of adolescents here in the sanctuary today, I'm sure that, and I was an adolescent once, I think it's part of, of being an adolescent to, to think that your parents don't understand you. I, I think that's, there's just... And, and, and we parents, we don't. <laughs> and we try. And sometimes we make mistakes and what we want to say doesn't come out the way we want to say it. Parenting is hard work, even for being an adolescent is hard for Jesus, for Mary, for this family. So there may be different ways that we can connect with this story. But ultimately, this story isn't about parenting or being an adolescent. It's not about family vacations. It's about wisdom. Because it really boils down to these two phrases in this story, your father and my father. Mary says to, to Jesus, your father and I were looking for you. As in, Jesus, you should be with your father and me. You should be with us. And Jesus pushes back and says, no, I must be in my heavenly father's house. And that's the key. But I would believe when, when Jesus says, I must be in my father's house, he's not rejecting his parents. Right? So he's not saying that he doesn't need his parents. Because verse 51 says, after this was over, he went back to Nazareth and was obedient to his mom and dad. So he's not rejecting his parents. And he's not saying that they don't play an important role in his life. Because Jesus knows that he's indebted to Joseph. 
He's indebted to Joseph for learning what carpentry is all about. And he's indebted to Joseph for learning the word of God. Because in the synagogues where Jesus would have worshipped, they were segregated by gender. Men sat in the front, women sat in the back. And that means that it would have been Joseph who took Joseph, or took Jesus into the synagogue and sat next to him and, and pointed to the, the rabbi and said, pay attention as the word of God was being spoken. So Jesus knows that he's indebted to his earthly parents. He's not rejecting them. And yet he still says, I must be in my father's house. And I believe it is to underscore for us how important it is that we protect this vertical relationship with God and how this vertical relationship with God has to transcend all of our horizontal earthly relationships with our families and friends. It has to. The vertical relationship with God has to transcend the horizontal relationships with one another for this simple reason. We lose people. We lose track of people. The story is about Mary and Joseph losing track of Jesus. Granted, only for a short time, but it's symbolic of how people come and people go in our lives. We lose them. We lose track of them. We lose people when they move away. We lose people when we move away or when we start a new job or when we, we leave high school and go to college or start a new career path or when we get married or when we get divorced or when we start a relationship or end a relationship. We're always taking leave of people. Think about your life, however old you are in the sanctuary today. And isn't it true that when you look back over your life, there was a group of people you were close to and then after a while, that group was replaced by a group here. And then when you went to college, maybe there was a new group that materialized. And when you started dating this particular person, a new circle of friends appeared. And, and, and so it goes on and on through life. People come and people go. And we lose people when they die. Now, thank goodness for Facebook and, and Instagram and and all the social media that's out there because now we can finally put our arms around all our friends, right? And I can connect with my friends from childhood and, and college and when I was a missionary in, in Russia and in East Germany, I can, I can, I can now, I, I'm connected with them all. Great, right? But how many of those friends that you have do you really follow? 30? 20? 50? You can have a thousand friends on Facebook, but how many do we really follow? People come and people go. But this relationship with God never changes. It's always there. It's the rock-solid continuity in the midst of all this fluctuation and transition. That's why Psalm 46 says, God is our rock and our refuge, even though everything else around us should change. That's why Psalm 121 says, it is the Lord who will keep your going out and your coming in from this time on and forevermore. This is the one constant amid all the sea of change. And that's why we love our parents and we adore our friends, but we worship only God. Today is week two of our sermon series called Seek Wisdom. And for those that are new today, what we're doing is pairing a verse from Proverbs 4 with uh, an assignment for the week as we move through Lent and move toward the season of Easter. So what we learn from Jesus in this story is how to nurture and strengthen this relationship with God. Jesus shows us three things in this, short, in this story. First, he took time to be in the house of God. Right? Number two, he took time to be in the word of God. And number three, he took time to be with the teachers of the word. And so keeping that in mind, our verse for the day is Proverbs 4.4, 4, which says, Hold fast to my word in your heart and live. And by that, one way we understand that is we live in the world by holding fast to the word of God in our heart. We live by holding fast to the word and allowing that word to guide us. So here's the assignment. It's on the yellow insert in your bulletin. If you have a bulletin with the yellow insert, you can take it with you. We'll post it online this week too. 
the question is, think about a situation in your life that you're facing this week for which you'd like some wisdom. Maybe it's a big decision you're making, or maybe it's a, a, a relationship. It involves a relationship you're in or an issue at work or at home. But think of an, an issue at school. Think of an issue that you are facing, a college choice or a career choice that you would like wisdom for. And answer these three questions to yourself. Number one, what has happened today on March 17th in the house of God that can help you in that? Number two, what have you heard today on March 17th from the word of God that can help you? And number three, who is somebody that you can consult for guidance and advice about that? Regardless of the issues we face at whatever age we are in life, these three things making time for the house of God, for the word of God, and for the mentors who can guide us in the word of God is a wonderful way that we can protect this relationship with God and allow that word to guide the way we live in the world. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for speaking to us a word of hope. We pray that the word that we have heard today makes uh, finds a home in our hearts and bears much fruit as we go forth from this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.